previous videos so yes we'll be speaking with um the village auntie hopefully she will join us again um yeah we'll be speaking with the village auntie angelica linta ali who is a certified sexual health educator intimacy intimacy expert um relationship coach amongst other things and the storyteller um she has a event coming up on the 2nd of january saturday a four-week event called soul revival which i want to hear a little bit about that um and also she has got some upcoming courses on kunyaza for couples um in spring 2022 god willing so definitely check her her out she is yeah she's like the go-to person especially when it comes to sexual pleasure and um intimacy not only for muslim women but also for people of other faiths um she is uh, i think she's based in the us but she's got experience studying in africa um and the middle east and saudi so she's got she's not only culturally competent but also she's got practical hands-on experience so hopefully when the village auntie joins we're we'll hearing a little bit more about her and what she's been up to and future plans and things like that oh lovely sorry I've disconnected by accident. Hopefully, I won't do that again. But um, yeah, Instagram kicked me out also, so I don't know. Maybe somebody doesn't want us to be great. <laughs> <laughs> it might be our previous conversation about the. Let's not talk about what we were speaking about. Okay, before. yeah, we won't. We won't mention it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, again, just for the benefit of um, people joining, do you mind very um, doing your high pitch introduction again and a little bit about your upcoming courses? Sure. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with me, my name is Angelica Lindsay Ali. I'm known on social media as The Village Auntie. I am a trained public health professional. I've been working in the field for over 20 years. I'm also a student of knowledge. I am not a Sheiko or an Alima in any way, shape, or form, but I believe it's important to partner my public health practice with sacred knowledge and information about my dean. And so I teach women about sexual health and sexual pleasure, how to take care of their bodies, how to nurture sensuality as well as sexuality, how to improve their marriages, but also how to seek pleasure that is not embodied in a sexual sense. Uh, and so in that regard, I teach spiritual intensives. And I also teach classes for women like me, women who feel as if there is something more that they can offer the world, but they don't know how to go about it. Um, this time of year, we have lots of vision board parties, which are great, lots of planning parties, but I'm doing Soul Revival, which is a four week course for women who feel stuck who need a master plan and a game plan for how to make their dreams come true. Uh, and so Soul Revival is going to use my method uh, for goal setting and planning and ma managing multiple projects at once, while also being a daughter, a wife, a mother, a friend, a business owner, an employee. Uh, so it will be a weekly session on Sunday mornings for one hour. People who have taken my classes before know that a one hour class for me is hard because we're, sometimes we're in there for four hours, but I'm committed to making this for busy women who don't have a lot of time on their calendar. And we're going to set out on a goal. You can decide how large or how small you want that to be. And I'm going to help you uh, with a master plan and a game plan for how to reach that goal. And we're going to do it together in community. We're going to not talk about manifesting. We're not going to talk about like the universe sending us good. We're going to center our practice around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, whether you are a Muslim or not, I think when we extract God from a situation, um, that's when we lead ourselves down a pathway where things can go awry. So we're going to put the spirituality back into goal setting and intention seeking and do it in community where we can have support, we can have encouragement, and also where we can have a space for problem solving. So that is Soul Revival, and it's a brand new course. Um, that I'm offering, and I'm really excited. It starts this Sunday. Wow, there's a lot to unpack there. And, and just quickly, <laughs> what inspired you to want to do this course, this Soul Revival? So I was talking with my manager, who is, so she's my manager, but she's also a friend, but she also considers herself like a student, a village auntie. And she was like, you know, Angie, you do a lot of things. You always have something going on and I feel like women need to know how to do that also because there are so many untapped resources in our community. We need to do a class. We're also acknowledging that we are still reeling from like the grief and trauma of the pandemic. We're still mourning lost opportunities, but we also have each day we have another chance to create another opportunity. So she said, I want you to teach women how to be like you in that sense. We know about the sex part. 
We know about like art of seduction. We know about all of that. But what about women who really want to be go-getters, women who have goals and aspirations? How can we help them? So that's how the class came. To and, and why are, and I know, I'm not, obviously, I know you can't speak for all, all women, but why do you, what, what are the, some of the main reasons why women feel, like you mentioned earlier about stuff, like women want to achieve things, but feel stuck? What are the main obstacles that's preventing women from achieving their potential? Uh, so I'll, I'll speak for myself. Uh, motherhood was a big thing that stopped me from achieving my potential. And I'm not saying that I don't love being a mother. Anyone who knows me knows that I feel like that's my greatest role. But I spent 10 years consecutively, either pregnant, nursing, or chasing toddlers around. So during that time, that was spent really nurturing and growing my family. And that's time that I don't regret at all. But I also realized that those were years that I did not spend writing. Those were years that I did not spend researching. You know, I love research. <laughs> those were years that I did not spend teaching. And it was very hard to come out of mommy mode and go back into Angelica mode. There, there were a few years there where I forgot who I was. I was um tige, not Angelica anymore. And I think um, from a religious perspective, but also just from a cultural perspective, we expect women to become someone's wife and that's who you are. You become someone's mother and that is who you are. And so we get stuck in those spaces. You also have women who may not be married who are the eldest daughter or they're the youngest daughter. They're the caretakers for their family. They're expected to take on all of these responsibilities. We don't, we, so, we sort of shift women from ownership to ownership. So you go from being someone's daughter to being someone's wife. I want to create a space in Soul Revival where we look at who are you? I don't want to know you as the wife of so-and-so, the mother of so-and-so. Who are you? What were your dreams that you had? At 46, I'm just now living dreams that I had as a 10-year-old. And I think that that's beautiful. But I also want people to not have to wait until they're as old as I am to live their dreams. And there's a way that you can compartmentalize your life to do that. Um, but I think that women are afraid to say the things that I'm saying. Um, because we feel that as if it means that we don't love our families or if we don't, you know, love our religion. We do. We just want to live multifaceted lives. And I think that women are not often given the space to do that. And who has, is, is, is it the woman herself who has to give herself the space or does the space have to be created by external people, people outside of herself? You got to take it. I think you have to take it. I think you have to take the space for yourself. And what that does is that teaches the people around you what's important to you, and then they act accordingly. So I had to take space for myself with storytelling, for example. I've always wanted to be a storyteller. My husband and my kids were not down for it. Like, mommy, where are you going to a story slam? No, that, like, you need to be at home cooking dinner. No, this is where I can operationalize the people in my life to do the things that they can do so that I can do what I wanted to do. Now, it's such where... When I tell them, okay, I have a show on this date, this date, this date, they already know what to do because I've taught them how to treat things that are important to me. And I make space for them. So I think, I think that's one of the, the ways that we fall, right? We wait for people to give us space. Ain't nobody going to give you space. You got to make, you got to make your own space. And, you know, I'm big, so I, I'm good at, like, <laughs> carving out a space for myself. And I, I want to teach other women to do the same thing. <laughs> And for women watching, is it just for women that are mothers or is it women of a certain age or is it open for everyone, irrespective of their age, marital status? Just this make it clear. Is, this is for all women. So Soul Revival is the program that I needed at 23. It's the program that I needed at 19. Right. Because um, I think there, there's there's a positionality that I have as a 40 something year old woman. So I'm not yet an elder, but I'm also not young. I'm, I'm in the middle, so I have to bridge that gap. So this is an opportunity for me to pour into those who are younger than me and who haven't gotten to this station in life. This is an, also an opportunity for me to redirect those who are my age and older who have sort of veered off the path. So this is for all women. Um, it's regardless of age. My daughter is 13. She's going to take the course. She's actually doing the slide deck for the course because she. one of the problems that she has is with time management. The pandemic has thrown people into a state where Everything is online. We have to shift how we work. We have to shift how we do things. And I don't know about you, but when I have a lot of things to do, I don't get anything done. So I'm, I want to show women how you can put plans in motion so that you can get things done. You can create a network and you don't have to be a mother. You could be a single woman who's just like, I want to write a novel. 
You can be a divorced woman who's like, I want to start my business. We're going to talk about ways that you can start to do that and give yourself permission to be successful at it as well. Lovely. And for women who are struggling to um, like put themselves first, is there like, I'm just wondering, in terms of how you're going to deliver the course, is it mainly aimed at people already at that place where they can, they're comfortable to kind of like take ownership and make space for themselves, as you mentioned, or is it kind of geared to people who are kind of struggling in the sense of how do they go about it by putting themselves first? I think I thrive in spaces with women who are uncomfortable and are afraid. So I think women who are, it's for everybody, right? So it's for women who are like, I don't know if I have a goal. Let's help you figure out one. It's for women who say, I have a goal, but I'm afraid of success. It's for women who say, well, I know what I want to do, but my husband and my children or my family won't let me. I thrive with those women because I think that being in a space, being in any village auntie space, and, and you know, I have students who are on the, the live who are listening and they can attest to this. I help to pull women out of that space of discomfort and let them know that the power is within you. And it's a uniquely feminine power that we have to create our own space and to nurture that own space. We just always direct it outward. So this is showing women how to do it. So you can be at any phase in your journey, right? You can be the woman with the business plan that's got dust on it sitting on the shelf. And you can be the woman who's saying, I don't know if I can really do this. This space is for you as well. And that's why we do it in community because I'm, I'm the, the facilitator. I'm the catalyst, you know, in, in the middle. But we also uh, pour into each other and give encouragement to each other along the way. Understand, understood. Wow. And again, I liked what you said about um, helping women like with their own identity. It's not about them being a mother or a, a wife or a daughter of someone. Because I think I, I do hear that a lot. And oftentimes that women kind of, and I, I don't know if the pressure is culturally, is it really from the religion? Is it from themselves? It's all. Where oftentimes, it's all, it's all. Oh, okay. Because this sense of selfishness, I mean, again, maybe because as men were socially conditioned to like, it's okay to be selfish. And in many cases, it's important to be, like to put yourself first, even from a religious perspective, like you, your soul and your body's got rights over you. So I, I'm just wondering for women who are struggling, who are always thinking they're the caregivers for everyone else apart from themselves, how do they, well, I'm assuming obviously by attending like your courses, for them to get to that stage where it's okay to kind of put yourself first. And, and I'm saying selfish, but not in a negative way. Because if you're suffering inside and you're always thinking about others, you're ultimately damaging yourself. So that, that's just something that I think maybe a lot of people kind of need to to hear in it. I actually put up a, a post a couple of weeks ago where it wasn't my words. It was something along the lines of, um, you don't need to set yourself on fire to keep other people warm. Uh -huh. And the response, I was just thinking like, wow, I didn't realise that. Maybe because I've always been a bit of a, not a self, but, I understand sometimes you need me time. I need time to detach from things and get myself straight. And I just think that oftentimes a lot of people, both men and women, but maybe women more so, probably find that quite difficult um, because they're managing different identities or roles and always kind of thinking about others when I don't think that's always helpful unless you've got someone that's going to be, that's going to remind you that, you know, you need to kind of look after yourself and kind of put yourself first at times. So, yeah, I definitely think hopefully, inshallah, the more people that can attend can benefit from it because I imagine this is something that's an ongoing problem with a lot, a lot of people, especially with a lot, a lot of women. Do you think it's it's harder when, I know you mentioned your situation when obviously you've been a mother for like 10 years and were able to achieve some of the things you wanted to. Is it harder when women enter like motherhood and wifehood or is it maybe like something that generally women have for their whole lives? I think it, it can be, it depends on what your family structure is growing up. So, you know, if you're a part of families where the daughters do everything and the daughters function as the second or third mother, it can be difficult your entire life, but absolutely 100% marriage and motherhood create obstacles to growth in some areas. And the, the key to getting past those obstacles is to recognize that these can be stepping stones and building blocks rather than roadblocks. Um, I, I use a lot of earth-based earth metaphors in my work, and it's like a tree, right? We have a moringa tree in the backyard. We used to have pet goats. The pet goats would just eat the leaves off this moringa tree such that it couldn't regenerate enough, and so the bottom half of the tree just died, 
like the, the 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 roots were still good the trunk was still good but these leaves just kept getting pulled and pulled and pulled and it just died and that's how a lot of women are walking around like we're alive like our physical structure is there but there's no vibrancy that's why i'm calling it soul revival because we're nurturing in so many spaces that we're just pouring from this seemingly end endless well but it's not endless there's no opportunity for rejuvenation and nourishment and even like even you you just came back from work right the way that we work this 40 hour work week you know working monday through friday when i lived in saudi it was working sunday through thursday that is all built around the idea that there's somebody else at home taking care of everything that mm -hmm. person is usually the mother right? It's usually the wife. So we have, it, society has already, this is not even religious, right? Society has already been built for us to believe that we are going to be the ones who take care of everything, right? So that's why this is for working women, but this is also for women who are housewives or who, has, who are stay-at-home mothers. We tend to think that like that is a woman's greatest like achievement in life to raise her family, but she's also a woman. She's also a person with goals and aspirations. Some of the greatest novels can be written by stay-at-home moms. Some of the greatest you know, medical discoveries and research can be written by people who have chosen to nurture their families. You can do both there's a space to do both and i want to teach you how without you know sacrificing or diminishing those other relationships and i think that that's a, a part of the conversation that we don't often hear especially mm. not in circles um and um can you touch on like the spirituality element because you mentioned um and i'm so familiar with like so your previous work when you talk about um, I think it's a last sentence, self-love, as opposed to just purely self-love. And can you talk to actually first the differences between that and why spirituality um, or God-centric or Allah-centric approach is important for the work that you're doing? I think it's important because a lot of what I see in the wellness industry, uh, a lot of what I see in the business and entrepreneurship coaching arena is really focused on what you can do, your individual power, your individual strengths. None of that. I have no power. I have no strength except by Allah. You can call Allah, Allah, God, the creator. Nothing that I do is possible if it was not for Allah. And even on those days when I feel like I cannot do, I have to remember that Allah can do anything. And so if I have access to this divine source of power, strength, and knowledge, then it doesn't matter what I don't know how to do. I can pray to Allah and I can believe that I can do these things because I have a master, right? I have a creator who is infinite and can do all things. So what that's done for me as an entrepreneur is that has taught me that failure is not the end, it's just another opportunity. Because Angelica is not failing, it just means that Allah gave me a test and Allah only tests those whom he loves and Allah only tests you because he wants to raise you. So it shifts everything. It's not that you know business incubator model that says, oh, when you fail, you just gotta get back and get right in there. You gotta shift this, you gotta do that. Sometimes that means saying, maybe Allah wants me to take a break. Maybe I need to reposition. Maybe I need to make some more sunnah prayers, right? Maybe I need to give some sadaqah. That's why charity is a huge part of the work that I do. Charity is, is a fundamental aspect of every religion, whether it's mainstream religion or you know, indigenous-based religion, making sure that it's a reciprocal model. I'm not just receiving as a business owner, I'm also nourishing my communities. So when I nourish my communities, they nourish me also. And then I receive blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because I know that whatever passes my hands is not from me and it's not for me, it's just for Allah. So I feel like it, it makes goal setting a lot more low stakes when you realize that you're not doing this just for your ego. Because a lot of a lot of vision boarding and planning that I see from like secular sources focuses on you have all the power. You can do it. You can do this. And God is completely left out of the conversation. And I find it problematic because uh, when people fail and they they feel like they're worthless, they are discounting themselves as a creation of Allah. So everything, if you put Allah at the center of everything, it just it just gives you a surefire roadmap to follow instead of just following your nuts. Yeah, I love that. I wish that was, um, I wish more people understood that, like really understood that, even like even Muslims in particular, because yeah, this idea that, and I, I couldn't agree more with everything what you said about 
everything is in their hands, it's in the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you have if you have the understanding that concept that even when you're struggling, you know who to turn to is your source of inspiration or source of power. So it's not everything you're relying upon yourself. And it puts actually less pressure on you. So that's why, but if you've got this idea that everything is from within, if you're struggling because you believe that you're some form of, you know, I don't know, like, but you think you've got all, like a deity that you've got all of the power, then obviously when you're struggling, then it doesn't make sense because you're supposed to be the source of power. When Whereas if you understand and realise that, no, it comes from Allah, it doesn't come from within, then even when you're struggling, that can actually help you even more. So for me, I'm, I'm for, again, amongst people that are... Um, like believe in God. I've never understood why people like to detach or devoid God or Allah from the picture when we're speaking about these type of things because it's actually for me it makes it, it makes things so much easier because obviously it's not only it's empowering but it's less pressure on yourself. So um yeah I'm, I'm glad you kind of you, you said that and hopefully people will not only listen to that but really um understand what that means and obviously they can implement that in their lives because we can say but if you don't really believe it and doesn't really it's not entrenched in your mind and your heart then it's not really going to do anything and that's the thing maybe it might be as well because when we're saying a lot of these other cards it's in Arabic and I think a lot of people don't read English so they don't really know what it means but when they read the mantras that's been translated and obviously they understand that that kind of really maybe makes more sense whereas if a lot of what we've been revealed to the Prophet in the Quran, if you really understand it, and a lot of the stories of people that, are, and all of the stories of people struggling, of mm -hmm. the prophets and the righteous people, they're all people struggling, mm -hmm. but they all turn to Allah as their source of power. Mm -hmm. It's all this, and it's all the same story. And, it's, and, it, and if you're seeing that, whether you are a high performing person, whether you're someone that's struggling, you have got examples of people, both men and women, that you can relate to. And they're showing you, they're not going to tell you that you're always going to be on top. No one's ever going to be on top. And that's why the whole, you know, that's not true. And in the same case, there's you're never always going to be at the bottom, but you know who to turn to. And I just think that's something that unfortunately, especially amongst um, people of faith and obviously Muslims in particular, I think that's what you maybe lost sight of that. You know, it's always, it's all about if I'm acting or looking like a Muslim, then I'll be in a good place. And it's just like, no, everyone will struggle and it's fine but you know who to turn to kind of thing. So um, I, I, think it also, I think it also has to do with what we think about Allah though, right? Because if, if we don't have a good opinion of Allah, right? Allah says, I am as my servant thinks I am. So if we think Allah is vengeful, if we think Allah is full of wrath and punishment, if we think that we're never good enough, then mm -hmm. we're not going to want to turn to Allah because you have, especially for a lot of women, right? You have women I don't I can't tell you how many women have cried to me and have said, I think Allah hates me. I think Allah doesn't love me because of the way that they've been taught about Allah. So Allah center self love is it's it's giving, you know, in, in the church, because I grew up in the church, and the church used to say, you know, we give it all to God, right? But if I'm giving it all to a God that I think hates me, why would I want to do that? Right. Why why would I want to center myself in a, a creator who is just focused on damnation. Even some of the Islamic websites you go to, you've seen them. They have like flames <laughs> in the background, <laughs> like yeah. thunderbolts <laughs> when yeah. you open. You know, we don't yeah. we don't see a lot as loving, as accommodating, as a source of genteel power. Um, we see a lot as you know, fire and brimstone, which is not really from our tradition. So I think that's that's another disconnect that happens with people is we don't have a good opinion of Allah, and so that's mm. what makes a loss of self love a hard concept for some people to adjust to. I hear that. I hear that. No, that's true. I'm just thinking about yeah. I... That's why they think the work we do is bad because they're like, but Allah doesn't want you to talk about yeah. sex. I'm but, like, but, oh, but, yes, because it's in. But the again, then, I, then I'm thinking, is it? And correct me if I'm, I'm just thinking out loud. Is it that people's have a wrong or bad opinion of Allah or what they've been taught? And the reason why I say that is because if you are, because no one, obviously from an Islamic perspective, there's no human being that can say, can speak on behalf of God. We know that, right? But if you want to know what Allah says, you have to read obviously the Quran or what the Prophet says. So if you are reading these sources, then you have a very different image than what is being taught by and it's just about hell and brimstone. Or just but about his wrong. If you, if you, if you, if you yourself read it, so I understand what you're saying, and this is why even for myself, there's sometimes where 
I'm not comfortable with the Muslim community, but it's never been and had an issue with 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 God, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But some for some people, the Muslim community is a law for them. That's that yes, I'm saying that's, they, a, that's but that's not Islam. But that, but th th that was for me. That's not, and that's something that even when I have and continue to struggle or do things I shouldn't be doing, it's never been an issue with Allah. It's the Muslim community because of maybe how I've been treated or people are very harsh or whatever. But it's but I know that these are people that claim to represent God, but they're not actually his true representatives all the, all the time because you don't know who his true representatives are. You don't know who are the people that's going to guide you. That you can form get some form of guidance even from someone that doesn't believe in God, in in some in some cases. So it's I, I've never really looked at it that. And again, maybe because I was taught from young, just mainly just concentrate on the Quran. And if you're reading the Quran, a lot of the people that are struggling, it's always between when they're struggling, they go to Allah. They don't go to their community. Whereas I think as Muslims, a lot we're thinking about getting validation and approval from the scholars, the learned people. And a lot of these cases, in a lot of cases, especially if these people let you down, then you might have a, an issue with God or it might affect your faith when in reality, even these people are a test for you. Your children are a test for you. Your spouses are a test for you. And this is in the Quran. So if you're reading that, it shouldn't shock you as much if you have the understanding, I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you put your faith in, again, whether it's your spouse, whether it's your children, whether it's your parents, whether it's the Muslim community, that you're in a danger, you're in a vulnerable position. Because if they disappoint you, then it can affect your faith. Do you, do you understand? I mean, and that's always something that I've always kind of not understood that, no, read the Quran, it's very clear. It's like, everyone is a test for you, potentially. And I understand that. Mm -hmm. I understand how you would have that perspective as a man. Okay. Because as a woman, the way a lot of women learn Islam is through mm. their fathers, through their yeah. husbands. They mm -hmm. only get access to the Quran, not the translation, right? But the Arabic Quran, they get their uh, translation and their commentary from a man. And so that can be filtered a certain way. So I've had sisters tell me, well, Angelica, Allah says that if I were to ever bow to a human being on earth, it would be my husband. So I have to do everything that he says. So you have you have people who are practicing minor shirk within their marriages because of someone's misguided interpretation of Islam. You have women who have never been able to really access Quran because maybe they haven't had access to, to Arabic classes. They don't get to go to the halakha. They're told that women don't have to go to the, the masjid. Even in 2021, you have women who don't understand their faith. And so they their, their connection to Islam is through these male figures, some of whom, not all, but some of whom are very dictatorial and dogmatic in, in pushing their culture or their desires. And so it separates people from really knowing Allah. That's why the book Secrets of Divine Love has been so popular because mm. it really looks at Allah from an Islamic perspective told by a woman who understands the ways in which women have been cut off from Allah. And, and it, it, it can be as simple as like, okay, well, the Quran says this, the stories of the Sahaba, the stories of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam say this, but then you'll always have someone who says, where the hadith says that you're supposed to appear like crows and you're supposed to do this and you're supposed to stay in the home. It's yeah, always, I see, you have people yeah. I so it, it becomes problematic. That's why these circles of knowledge are important. And that's why it's important that people see us talking, right? A man and a woman talking yeah. to each other about Islam because this, people will say, is even haram. Well, a woman shouldn't be talking to a man. Habib is not her husband. Why is she having a conversation with him? That doesn't come from Islam. That comes that comes from yeah. culture. So, yeah. yeah. No, I, I, no, yeah. I sound corrected and, yeah. You, you are no, right. No, and I, and I wasn't. I didn't want no, to. No, I, no, I, no, in a, yeah. no, I stand corrected. And no, you're, you're right. And um, I'm just thinking, because, yeah, that, that book, The Secrets of Divine Love, is a really, really, it's an amazing book. And I think one of, I think the reason why I resonated with so many people, even non Muslims alike, was because she mainly concentrated, I think she's mainly just concentrated on the Quran. She didn't really talk too much on the hadith because mm -hmm. that's when, again, especially when there's certain hadiths that we can be misinterpreted. Yeah. And then a lot of times, even as Muslims, people concentrate on like the legality of certain rulings. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Whereas obviously when you're reading the Quran, a lot of it is not the stories and they are inspiring stories and they both feature both male and female protagonists that you can be inspired from by. You don't it's not obsessed with like the, the rulings as such, you know. So yeah, I can see why people and again again I'm just thinking like what you said, it might be because I'm a man and then you're but I would always say you yeah, always try and go back to the Quran first. Always. Always. Go back to for, for yourself because as oh. well, I, you, you, there's not, you can't stop someone from saying you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. Yes, I know it's easier for me to say that as a man, but that is something that you can't, you can't solve. You can't resolve that. But what you can do is like the same way you're talking about your course and taking ownership and giving yourself permission. You can pick up the Quran, you can read it because it will, if you want something to melt your heart, it's the book of Allah. There's nothing else in the family. The, some people, I've actually met it. Someone um, messaged me uh, last week and was asking, um, oh, why don't you post much um, about the Quran a lot in your stories? I said, A, because I'm doing, I'm serving like a particular purpose. And sometimes it can be confusing for people if you're speaking about mm-hmm. religion when people, unfortunately, they feel, as soon as they hear religion, they just feel, they, they turn away. They hear spirituality, if they hear maybe manifesting, if they hear universe, Mm-hmm. They're more welcome into that. But obviously, I don't subscribe mm-hmm. to those those tenants. I don't mention that. But the same, but it's it's if people are impressed by okay, some of what I'm saying, and they were to ask me where am I getting it from, then I'll show you. Mm-hmm. So that's how I'm kind of approaching. It. Because unfortunately, for some for a lot of people, even Muslims, you mention the Quran, you mention Islam, people are they don't want to hear about it as yep. if they can't benefit from it. But if you say other things that you know, it's, it's, it's quite, you know, like spirituality and things like that. People are more welcoming to it when it's, they're all more or less saying one and the same thing in terms of the goal to try and help up, uplift and inspire and purify our hearts and souls. So it's just about, I think maybe we have to be a bit more like the way you're doing, like clever in terms of how we're delivering the message. The message is the same, mm-hmm. but unfortunately a lot of people, there's a lot of like psychological mental blockages that they've got yeah. when they hear Islam, when they hear Allah. And that's, again, maybe because of how they were raised and, um, their perception of, of of God, which is to me, is the worst thing. Like if someone feels like it's to despair from the mercy of Allah is like one of the worst things. To feel that no matter what you've done, God can't forgive you. Like I, that is something to have that as a permanent state or for state for a long period of time. That is a problem. Mm-hmm. No, irrespective of what you're doing, how you're dressed, or whatever. To, for someone to feel that. Like there's no hope, that is a problem. And if that's something that a lot of women are suffering from, then that's a that's a big issue. But it, it, now, in terms of again trying to help solve this, what could men do? So you spoke about women, what, men who have got obviously like who are married or got sisters, friends. What can they do to kind of help um, women on this path? Because a lot of us are blind to it. I'll be honest. Yes, uh, I think one is listening to women. And not just hearing, but listening. Listening in earnest and resisting the urge to interject, correct, and redirect, I think is important. Uh, And I think you modeled that very well for for men. I wish that all the conversations that I had with men are like the conversations that I have with you. Because when you talk to me, I know that you see me as an equal, right? From day one, before we even like met in person, you never talk like down to me. Oh, Angelica, I went to Al Azhar. I did this. I did that. I wrote this book. I wrote that book. It's no. Habib and Angelica are having a conversation. I think having horizontal conversations um, are important. I also think that it's important for men to create and protect spaces for women to learn from each other. Because Aisha, radiallahu anha, most of the ahadith that we get about Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that have not been disputed have come through her. Right? Women can learn from other women. And I think it's important for men to uphold a woman's right to teach direct and guide other women in certain aspects and not feel as if, you know, if it doesn't come from a man, it's not valid because you have a lot of women who feel that way. And unfortunately, it seems twisted, but sometimes you need a man to validate a woman and other for other women to listen to her. So I think that's another thing that men can do is create and protect those spaces. And if you have daughters, you have sisters, you have nieces, people who are younger than you, um, wives even, people that women that you have influence over in their lives, make sure that they have access to halakas. They have access to Quran memorization programs. They have access to seminary and alamiya programs, um, just like the boys do, because the first makaranta, right? The first madrasa is the mother's lap. 
So it is helping your family when you have learned women who are a part of that. And men are the ones who can change that tide. You know, if you are invited to be on a panel and everybody speaking is a man, no matter the topic, ask, why don't we bring a, a, a woman? Why don't we bring a female scholar? Why don't we bring a female teacher? There should not be all male panels for Ramadan every year. <laughs> I'm sorry. There should not be all uh, male panels talking about the life of Hajar alayhi salam. I'm sorry. Like there, there should be spaces where men feel it appropriate to see their space. I'm going to step aside so that this sister can step in because that's the way that we'll start to shift things. And that's really the way, especially for people who um, say that they are Salafi and they follow, you know, the, the path of Salafi. The Salafi, that's what they did. That's what the Salaf did. Like that, that is what was a part of the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the generations that came after, there were women who were teachers. There were women who were learned. There were women who have access. And that's what we have to return back to. And it's the men who are going to have to, to, to make space for that. That's the only reason why I'm able to really do the work that I'm able to do is because there are men behind the scenes were like nope sister angelica is legit nope sister angelica is certified nope sister legit yep nope sister angelica is yep she she's the one so though there are men there are just as many men who support me but they feel comfortable supporting me behind the scenes that's the other thing men should not be like well i started this girl school this is not about you at some point men have to be willing to step aside and and allow women to shine so that they can grow and reconnect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's one of the reasons why we're experiencing so many problems in the Ummah is because there's this imbalance. And it's not that men are bad, right? It's not that men yeah. are bad, but it's that a, it's a whole arm of the body of the Ummah, a whole half of the body of the Ummah is feeling as if we cannot. We're suffering from like a spiritual psychosomatic condition where we feel as if we don't have access to Allah and the other side of the body needs to help us reconnect and, and be more visible out there. So that's what men can do. It's a tall order, but they can do it. Mm -hmm. can yeah, do and it. I think even with men, you know, like how you, met, you was mentioning like how Allah God is taken out of the picture when in the, oftentimes in the wellness industry, even with a lot of the, um, I don't know the word to call it, but a lot of the spaces where now they're encouraging men to like be men and mm -hmm. um, look after their a lot is taken out of the picture as well. And the problem with that is then, with obviously with a lot of men, especially, okay, you are this, you know, this man that's doing well for himself and you've got people that you're looking after, this, that, and the other. You can have this for an own complex where you start to feel that you're somewhat godlike. And that's a test for men as well that people don't realise. It's not, okay, there's, we spoke about the women's test, but men also, and especially if you're someone that you're in a position of power, that can get to your head. Yeah, yeah. You're a human what? being that can get to your head, and that's something that I don't think even as men we probably check ourselves and remind ourselves of that. And that's why it's good to be humbled and for someone to, you know, metaphorically like slap you in your face or to check you because you need that. But if you're always, and even, and, and this is one of the reasons why I personally don't like to spend too much time in just Muslim only spaces, I realized, um, I noticed this when I came back from Egypt, is that some people that I grew up with. When you start, so for example, when I started, I came back some teaching or speaking or whatever, doing some courses or lectures, some or some of it in Arabic or whatever. The way people look at you, some people that even you knew like just a couple of years ago, it's not good for the soul. Mm -hmm. And then people will praise you more than, and it's not, and that's something that people don't realize. And they think, oh, you're trying to be humble. Or you're not, you're you are humble. And that's even that is not good. And the things where people praise you, and obviously because maybe they're benefiting from you, that's all well and good. Whereas, it's not good for the person that's receiving that yeah. to always be. That's why some, and I realize actually sometimes it's good when people see you're a human being, you see the bad, they see the things that they disagree with. And then generally if they're kind of following you or seeing you, they will take what they like and what they don't like, they won't take, but that's fine. But they see you as a human being. When you're just this revered figure, especially like in religious circles and you're just obviously eloquent, you're speaking about the Quran, you're speaking about the Prophet, you're speaking about all good things. And naturally people will just like every word that you're saying. Mm -hmm. but they're not seeing the human being mm -hmm. and that's something that when you look at the people of the past you hear all of these stories that and people or scholars saying things that people are surprised by because when i think a lot of people look at religious figures they look at them as just this religious figure this like mm -hmm. a scholar and Alan, what does that mean to the human being mm -hmm. he still not only goes to the bathroom but he also has still has his issues he still has his vices 
but people kind of forget that. And I'm not saying you should put them out there for the world to see, but when you realise that you're seeing your humanity in even people that you respect, then you can take what A won't affect you when some people may let you down, and B you realise that you can you see the faults in people. So you, not everyone that's not everything that someone says, in respect of where they've studied, you can you take it as that's from God because they're not speaking; they're giving their own opinion. And even yeah. when people talk about and just coming to some of what you said, speaking about giving women spaces or helping women have create their own spaces. When you said, and you said this in the beginning, I don't know why you said this. You said it twice. You said, <laughs> I'm not a sheikh, I'm not an ali. But now, why, I, I was uncomfortable with you saying that. The reason being is because you know your stuff and what you're talking about, you're, I, I, I don't like to use the word sheikh because when people think sheikh, or even unfortunately when people use the word scholar, they mm -hmm. generally um, use it in a sense of someone that's going to give legal opinion, like a jurist. Mm -hmm. Right. Someone who is knowledgeable, expert, well, in 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 that particular field, yes, they are a, sc in a scholar in that regard. And I think, unfortunately, even as Muslims, when we use these terms that someone's a scholar, someone's a sheikh, they use it meaning someone can give me fatwa, mm -hmm. and that's a different. The same way someone can be a scholar in different fields in terms of humanities, but they're not going to give you a legal ruling. And there's mm -hmm. people that are lawyers or solicitors, but they're not. They can't give a ruling on everything. But unfortunately, as when you're somewhat, in the, and again, in the Muslim spaces or Islamic spaces, you have to be a counsellor, you know, a religious ad advisor, a financial consultant. You need to be an orator. You need, to be, you need to be so much, so many things. And people put ridiculous pressure on people who have just, they're still learning in the university of life and they're going to make mistakes. And some of what they're saying, and even when you're giving, and I liked what you did when... Um, I think one of your stories, you responded that this is this is for this particular person. Yes. So if you're giving advice, and that's something that people fail that to realize. Well. And making good yes. Advice. And people and people and people and people fail to realize realize is that there's times when you're giving advice, or when people's giving advice, it's specific to that particular person. It's not for everyone. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was understood in the past. Mm -hmm. And even um, one particular story where. Um, there was a companion who went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he, he, he said that he'd been um, fondling with a woman that was his wife in the outskirts of Medina. Mm -hmm. And the reverse was revealed that, you know, you should make prayer like to, and good deeds um, erase or remove bad deeds. Then another companion went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him, is that specific for him or is that for the Muslims at large? And he said, no, it's for the Muslims at large. As in, if you do a bad deed, if you do commit a sin, just do, you do a good deed to replace that. And even that understanding, there's so many things you can get from that story in and of itself. A, yes, this is a religious, righteous person who committed sin. A lot of people would be surprised by that. It happens. The <laughs> Prophet's response wasn't a stuck for a lie. A Muslim wouldn't do that. If You know, things happen. People, you know, and, and not only you acknowledge that, okay, this person, not only he went for help, but he gave him, or Allah revealed a verse that helps him, okay, yes, you've done something that's wrong, but do a good deed and that will replace what you've done that's a misdeed. It's as simple as that. So that's why, again, I always try and encourage people, try and be attached to the Quran and the stories of the people of the past, the first people of the past. Yeah. Because when Islam became, because they formalized with the rulings and the legal schools and things like that, that's when all the rigid stuff came into place, where everyone felt like, I can't do anything without asking my scholar, my sheikh, am I allowed to do X, Y, and Z? When a lot of stuff, you can just you know, consult your heart and, and that's and like like you're doing other stuff in life. So um but yeah, so just coming to I kind of went off on the tangent. Just coming to like with people like yourself who know their stuff and who are knowledgeable and experts. And again I can understand because you know maybe you don't want to go around saying I'm a sheikh and I don't like using the word like like I said like scholar or sheikh but you shouldn't say I well, I don't believe you should say I'm not a scholar. You all, like you just said, I'm not this, I'm not that. No, you know your stuff. You've got, got 20 years worth of experience. You've got testimonies from women around the world. There's no, I don't think there's anything wrong in that, like letting people know what you're bringing to the table, what value you're, inshallah, you're going to be giving to people, both Muslim and non-Muslim. So to, mm -hmm. to like, I'm, I, I notice that often from women more than men. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, that's something that, and not, they don't need, a man's validation to certify them because but i just find that that's kind of not helping as well i'm not it's, this i'm not that you know which i can understand why people do it 
But at the same time, I just you don't... You get me on this every time. Every time we talk. Yeah, I just, just, yeah. that's why I said do the elevator page. Let's see now. Let's... Every time. Yes. So let me, tell you, let me tell you why. Let me explain. It's two reasons why. Mm-hmm. One reason why is because of what you just said, right? The way that people look at you. I never want to... Because, I mean, I struggle just like any other Muslim, right? Yeah. I, I, I am not a perfect human being at all. So I want to make sure that I keep a level of humility so I'm not walking around calling myself Ustaza so-and-so, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Even if that, you know, an Ustaza is just a teacher, right? So technically, yes, that's what I am. So one is to make sure that I keep my nafs in check. The other thing has to do with a level of anti-Blackness in the Muslim community such that you can have a brother, and I've seen this happen, you can have a brother who is a student at the university who's from a Gulf country and people will just assume like if the imam is not present, they'll ask him to lead the salah. They don't care how much Quran he knows. They don't care if he's reciting it properly. He must know because he has access to Arabic and because he's Arab. So let's make him the imam. I've seen it happen with, um, you know, women who come from, predominantly Muslim cultures and they are asked to be the Islamic weekend school teacher and the this and that because it's just assumed. When I say that I'm a student of knowledge, I always get people who say, well, who did you study from? And who was your teacher? And where did you, and I can give them the names, right? But if it's some, you know, if it's some woman who's uh, Hafiz Quran, who's memorized multiple books of um, a hadith, but she lives in a small village in Ghana and they don't know who she is, it doesn't count. So if it's not from these big, well-known names, yeah. some of these, then people, um, they dismiss the knowledge. So it's it's something that I say to keep people off my case because we run this thing of like, oh, well, you're, you're a teacher, so uh, who were your teachers? And which books of fiqh do you teach? My sheikh, Sheikh Mahi Sise, who is a scholar, who is mm. well known, mashallah. He has told me, Angelica, keep doing what you're doing. He has yeah. given me permission to teach fit. He's he said, You teach Maliki fit. I you have my permission to teach this to the sisters. They need to learn Maliki fit. I still am reluctant to do it because people are like, Oh, did you go to this school? Did you go to this school? Did you do this school? Mm. So that's something that I have to become comfortable with dealing because there's just a lot of nonsense and, and then just being a woman who's a, a student of knowledge, people will say, well, you don't know Arabic. You don't, um, you don't, you're not fluent in Arabic. You haven't memorized the entirety of the Quran. And I'm like, but neither has your favorite Sheikh, but okay, go off. Right. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, it's, I, I have to, I, yeah, I don't know. I have to become comfortable with it, but that, that's why, that's, that's why I do it. I think people who interact with me in my classes would say something different and I also think it's important for me not to give myself labels so Mm -hmm. I don't want to say call me Ustaza Angelica call me this call me that I think it is up to the students to call a person that thing and Mm -hmm. I'm also don't like the title Sheikha just in general for the mm-hmm. same reasons that you mentioned. But that's why I, I push against it because I don't want to have to go through like the verification. It's like TSA in the Islamic community. <laughs> like, <laughs> make stuff, put your liquids in a bag, like where no. your ijazad from and all of that stuff. I don't want to have to do that. So I'm doing that. <laughs> no, I, I hear that. And it's just, it's, it's funny now because I, I'm just remembering even when I was studying in Egypt, you do, even amongst the scholars of the past, they had this as well, like, who's a scholar, who's not a scholar, because again, they were looking at it from the perspective of a scholar that can give um, rulings directly from the Quran and, and, and the Sunnah, or those that had to follow, you know, so they, they were mainly talking about it from a fiqh perspective, and then they're saying there's others that come after them, they're not a mujtahid, they can, so it's always, a lot of people when they're talking about it, they're speaking on the, on the realms of giving religious rulers and that is the highest and most difficult and I don't think most people if they really know what it entails they would want to put themselves in that position in, in any way Never. so that's so that so that's that but then there's other types of like scholars or knowledgeable people in different fields and people recognize that but unfortunately and you know like we've been because people use the terms interchangeably someone could be a scholar in like the Quran or Tafsir but they just assume that okay because you're a scholar in the Quran you must be a scholar in all the other Islamic sciences. And that's why even me both, I prefer not to um, use those terms now, like student of knowledge. Mm-hmm. I used to use it. I don't like, like scholar 
and um, Sheikh just because, like, not even mention it. Like, I'm not a this or I'm the, I don't even mention it. So, and it's probably easier for me, I find, using, um, like, uh, even not using labels or using label or titles that are more secular in the sense that people will respect that. Mm-hmm. But they won't listen. But because of when you put the religious attachment, like yeah. they think it's religious, like Alim Sheikh, they just they assume it mm-hmm. means like you know like someone who is like Imam Malik or something like that, and it's just like well, and even just on a practical level, especially when we're speaking about like even the, what you're talking about and helping. And I've never understood this. Why would someone feel that someone living in S- Saudi or even? parts of Africa could give a woman or even a young man or even a man of a certain age better advice in terms of how to better themselves in a total different context, like those total different cultural context. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't. And even Islamically, you've got examples of Imam Malik when someone from Iraq came to Medin, asked him 40 questions, he only answered like three. For the rest, he said, I don't know, because he doesn't understand. The, especially when you're giving advice to someone, mm-hmm. You give it advice and understand, and not knowing the ramification, the cultural context they're coming from, you can do more harm than good. So many times, the best advice is to keep silent. Mm-hmm. And people forget even when a lot of times when people ask the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam question, he kept silent. Yep. So that's it's like it's the, that's the thing that frustrates me. That, but again, the pressure is when you're like a religious person or religious speaker, people will give you a lot of questions. The same way I ask. Question for the village answer yesterday. Some of the questions I was like, God, I'm not asking this. <laughs> a lot of it is like rule ways. Oh, oh, my husband is such and such. My wife is such and such. Should I divorce her? Can I do this? And it's just like, wow, like it's a lot of pressure you're putting on people. Mm-hmm. And men are men do that as well. I had a mm-hmm. um and that's why I generally don't like to and forgive me if anyone's asking questions or messaging me and I'm not responding <laughs> because sometimes it's easier for me to speak to a person, but when you entertain for like the tribe and everyone, you're inundated with questions, and a lot of those questions they can they can impact people's lives. It's not just a, a simple answer you can give. But anyway, going back to I had the Twitter space last week. Um, it was organised by some Nigerian Muslims, and there was um, people from other parts of the world that attended. Um, and then one, so I mentioned it was about um, sexual satisfaction in marriage. And then there was a brother, I think he's maybe from the Indian subcontinent, maybe like in his late 40s, early 50s. But he'd been married for over like 15 years. He's got a few children. So I'm playing the story so you can see, just so you can, I'm I'm building it up. So he, um, you know, all the pleasantries in the beginning, nice, 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 get on with it. Then he asked the question, okay, so you mentioned, so I mentioned like there are some signs, and I said some signs of a woman who is sexually frustrated, and then, and then mentioned five. So he said, okay, so you mentioned these five signs. So if my wife shows these five signs, is this does this mean a red line, then I can divorce her? That's like, he said that these are five conditions. So that's A, I never said conditions. B, I said all signs. It doesn't mean it's applicable to everyone. And how can you ask me to, to say, oh, what is, oh, what's the red line that no. I can divorce her? And that's the problem. So as much as, um, you know, like people, some of the questions people ask, what what you want to do is you want, like some of the questions, it's like you're asking people and you can ask 10 different people um, a question Mm -hmm. and you know what you could, the kind of answer you're looking for, if that makes sense. I I do see that with men a lot, to be honest. They want justification that this sheikh says such and such. So the same people that may be accusing women or speaking ill of women saying this is haram you can't do this you can't do that they will know of scholars or people that have got no issue with it but they'll just concentrate on people that says that basically supports what what they want kind of thing so that leader yes yes and that's why it's important that even you yourself you can't whether obviously you're a man or woman you can't and again you're never going to be in a situation where everyone is going to agree with you and i think even muslims need to understand obviously women in, in particular because and i know it's easier to say because obviously i'm a man and i definitely don't receive no way near the amount of um abusive messages that i would receive if i was a woman doing what i'm doing um but it's important maybe to then surround yourself whether it's physically or like virtually with people who, who kind of maybe are going through something similar so then they can kind of help support you but also to recognize that you never get to a place where everyone is going to accept you or what you're doing because that is a problem that um, 
I do hear a lot that people want, and I don't know, this utopia that people are seeking, you're not getting in this world, but if you're seeking that, then that's definitely maybe going to be a big stumbling block f- for you to kind of then achieve the things that you want to achieve. So then coming back to like your course, for women who have, and I'm speaking obviously about women because obviously the course is for women, who have like an imposter syndrome, how can they, first, do you mind talking a little bit about that and how, like by attending your course, how can that help them, um, especially people that have got like an imposter syndrome? Sure. Can you hear me, Habib? I can hear you clearly, yeah. Can if somebody tries to call me, and sometimes when people try to call me, it throws out my sound. So I think imposter syndrome is really denying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's talents and gifts that he's giving you. So it's one way of denying yourself as a part of a lost creation. And imposter syndrome, I really find that it exists in Western culture amongst certain types of people who feel as if we don't deserve good in our lives. It's not that we don't think that we can, it's we think that we are not deserving of it. And so that goes back to that Allah center self-love concept, right? And the way that we'll deal with it in soul revival is, so I have a bloom strategy which I talked about in my free workshop. And it's an acronym, believe, lead, operationalize, optimize, and manage. And it starts with the belief that the good that you are seeking, you are worthy of. That's where you have to start. You have to start by believing that you're worthy of this goodness. um, And that is the biggest stumbling block. Mm -hmm. That's how you get past imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome happens when you start doing the work, but you don't believe that the good that is coming from it should go to you. You believe that it should go to someone else. Mm. That's the challenge. Mm. And that's something that a lot of women have because you'll have women who are like, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't have a six figure business. I only have a high school diploma. Well, Allah said you should because you got it. So now what are you mm. going to do? Right. Um, so that's, that's how we'll deal with it in soul revival. And it happens in community because you have affirmation from other women who are going through the exact same thing. And one of the ways that I get past imposter syndrome. Anytime I feel like I'm not good enough or why should I be doing this thing, I think about the fact that I'm already doing it. Like I'm already doing the thing that I feel feel like I shouldn't be doing. So how can I say I shouldn't be doing this thing? I'm looking at myself riding the bike as I'm saying, I can't ride a two-wheeler and I'm going through curves and I'm doing all of these things. I'm literally... I'm, I'm piloting the plane as I'm building it and flying it. And I'm saying, I'm not good enough to do this. So that's one of the ways um, I, I think we don't give ourselves as human beings an opportunity to stop, pause, and look at the good that we're doing and give ourselves, you know, congratulations, you know, and acknowledge it. Like, this is something good. Like, you're doing something good. We feel um, that it's being boastful or it's being arrogant, but everybody needs affirmation. And I think the best place to find that affirmation is from within, and that's the easiest way to get past imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. And and um, you mentioned that you, you find um, Western, I mean, Imposter syndrome is especially quite common in like Western society. Why? Why is that? Why is it particular to? And, and I'm sure obviously people in other societies suffer from it. But what, what do you think is distinctive about Western culture? Why a lot of people seem to be struggling with this? Because we're only our value is determined by our output. Mm. Our value is determined by what we're able to produce, like what we're able to create. And so, if if we feel as if we're not creating enough, or we're creating much or people who look like me or who have come up like me don't usually create then why am i at this level um we are products of productivity that's that's where our value comes from and soul revival pushes back and says no you are valuable because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that you should exist and that's mm-hmm. where your value comes from not what you can produce and i think western culture produces that a lot because you you're from nigeria right i've mm-hmm. never been to nigeria but i've been to ghana and i've been to senegal and you see people who they they just the, the confidence is just it's there it's the person who gets up at the wedding who can't dance but will hold the whole center of the circle right, <laughs> right? It's, the, it's the person who has the biggest grand boo boo right showing up yeah. in the next year but they live in like a little one room check you cannot tell this person that they are not the king of the village right this imposter yeah. syndrome this but but the culture is affirmative western culture is not affirmative at all it, mm. it is Western culture knocks you down. How dare you think you're worthy? How dare you think you're good enough? You're not, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not. And yeah. it makes you feel guilty. So I think that's that's one of the ways in which the West, America and Europe specifically, that's one of the ways in which we continue um, imposter syndrome and why it festers. Do you have time 
for to go on, to continue. Yeah, cause I just literally got a message. So fifteen seconds left before it's gonna cut down. I, I don't. This is something new on Instagram. I'm not seeing this before. Okay. So literally, I'm gonna save this now and you then can we'll... hop off and hop back on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Inshallah. Inshallah.